All right, so let's continue on with lesson five, networking essentials and the hub. So as it says, a hub is a device that joins all of the devices of a network together. Every network device connects directly to the hub through a port. The hub forwards data frames, packets from a connected device to other connected devices. Now, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I wish I had a better tablet to where I could draw a better picture. But let's say that this was a hub and each of these is an ethernet connector, a port where we could put a computer. Now, I wanna show you the difference essentially between a hub and a switch. So basically what a hub would do is if we had something connected in here, okay, it would then say, all right, well, I then wanna send it, let me pause for a minute here because I was simply using the wrong tool. I'm gonna go ahead and use the pencil tool here and I'll make it red. Okay, so again, we have something connected here, all right? And what we wanna do is we wanna go ahead and send data over to some computing device connected here. So here's the thing though. <laughs> With a hub, what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, are you what I need? No, are you what I need? No, are you what I need? No. Are you what I need? Yes. And then the yes is gonna come back the same way. Hey, did you say yes? No, did you say yes? No, did you say yes? You get the idea. So that's a hub. A hub was a very inefficient device. Now for its day, it worked beautifully. However, it had to ask and send the data. Today, most hubs no longer exist and we have what's called a switch. So a switch performs the same tasks as a hub, but works much faster because a switch filters the target for the data frame and forwards it only to the specific device on the LAN. So let's go back here and now I'll go undo this and I'll say, we're gonna deal with a switch, okay? So again, we have a computing device connected here and we wanna this time send it here. Well, the switch has a table of information that knows what's on port one, what's on port two, what's on port three. So this time around, and I'll go ahead and make this blue here. This time around, what happens is the data, instead of coming from right here and asking each port, are you the one? It goes to the routing table and says, which computer is connected to port five? And it says, oh, that's the computer I want. And it then forwards the data right on. So we don't have that, remember the old game telephone and how the data could get messed up and was slow? Well, here we have a switch. It goes from port to port to get where the information needs to go faster. So that's what we have. Now today we know that networks tend to run, wired networks tend to run at either, either 100 megabits per second or 1000 megabits per second, which we call a gigabit. So you can imagine that a switch having this table that knows exactly where to send the data, which computer I'm sending it to, makes that whole process much, much faster. <clears throat> a router, on the other hand, should not be confused with a switch. A router directs the flow of data from the local area network to another network. Now we saw that previous picture where we had in the center a bunch of routers. This is what makes the internet work, folks, are routers. I may have a router at home, okay, that'll route data to other networks. Thus, if you think about it, I have a network, it has a gateway, and that gateway forwards that information onto the internet. Now, if this doesn't make sense, let me go out to a command prompt here. Okay, I'm gonna change the directories, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to first of all ping, <coughs> which is basically saying, hey, is something there. So I'm gonna ask, hey Google, by doing ping www.google.com, are you there? And so I'll run that real quick. So unfortunately, wouldn't you know, right when I wanna demonstrate the command prompt um, and some tools, well, my network connecting to the internet isn't working. If you notice, it's timed out and this shouldn't be the response that I get. So I'll do a separate video that demonstrates that so that we can see what a router is. But basically, as we traverse the internet, a router is gonna take those data packets, those datagrams, 
and route them to the appropriate server and route whatever the server wants to give back, back to my computer. So that'll make more sense. Now, <laughs> not gonna spend much time on a network interface card. We've talked about these. We need one of these to connect to an internet, uh, to the internet or to a network from our computing device. So on our smartphones, this is gonna be a wireless NIC. Uh, most of our computers now are wireless NIC and then, and or a wired NIC for like desktops. So software components, uh, software is used to set up, manage and monitor communication networks. So it, one example would be Microsoft has a product called, called server. And in server, we can create a thing called an active directory. And as it sounds like, it's a directory of users and computers and devices that we can then make available to users on the network as well as secure. So maybe I can get in and manage a server, but you couldn't, for example. So applications or program provide remote access to networks and tools needed to transmit data. So inside our, our operating systems, whether it be Android, whether it be uh, iOS, whether it be Windows, Mac, whatever the case may be, we're gonna have software built in that already knows how to take that data, transmit it to the internet, or and or transmit it to another computer. So we have the way, we have the data, and then of course we need to have rules of how this data is communicated, and we call these communications protocol. Um, it's a description of rules computers follow to identify devices and transmit data. So where the internet is concerned, we use a communication protocol called TCP IP. It's Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. So it is a series of rules that tell the computer what data can be transferred, who it can be transferred to, and how it is transferred, how it is broken up. So an IP packet, for example, would have the IP address of the computer that it came from, the IP address of the computer that it's going to, any specific information that it needs, as well as the data itself. So a good example of this, by the way, might be a simple text message. Text messaging originally started out as being only one packet's worth of data. That's why we were limited to, I think it's 126 characters. Don't hold me to that. Um, you can look that up in a single text message. Now, of course, when we send text messages, it just sends multiple packets. But at the time, the internet wasn't fast enough, and this was a way for us to send short communication methods in a very quick way. So operating systems, we've talked enough about these, you know, three most common, Microsoft Windows, OS X, Linux, or Unix, for example. And then addressing. So addressing, an address is a unique identifier for each computer. Now, I will go in this more detail when I get that command prompt video up for you. I will show you, for example, the unique IP address for each computing device on my network, how that all gets transferred to a gateway or a routable IP address on the internet. Now, the best way to think about this, and we've talked about this in class a little bit, is the idea, just like houses, there is no house in a single city with the same address. It may be close, but it's not gonna be exact. So even though we might have 100 apartments at 100 Southwest 5th Street, for example, one is gonna be apartment one, apartment two, apartment three. So there's always a unique way to route mail to each department and IP addressing works the same way. Now, network interface cards not only get an IP address, but they also have a thing called a media access control address for communications on the physical network segment. So MAC address to MAC address. Every NIC card is given a unique address. So we'll never find two NIC cards that have the same address. So addressing or an IP address, um, if you go out to your command prompt, let's see if this will work real quick, or if it's the command prompt that I'm having the problem with. If I do IP config forward slash all, as you can see, it's going to give me all of my devices that can handle routing and what the IP address currently is for that device. So for example, if we come down here, 
we can see that my wireless LAN adapter, my wireless network interface card, is currently connected to Bend Broadband. It has a 10.10.10.104, that's gonna be its internal LAN address. All of that routes to 10.10.10.1, and then finally, it goes out to Ben Broadband. So what we're seeing here is the local information, and it then is gonna route through this address out to a routable IP address that Ben Broadband gives. So that's gonna be the IP address. And then of course, we also would see the MAC address here. Uh, the physical address is the MAC address. So this is the unique MAC address for my wireless adapter. So before a computer can access data on the internet, the computer must be translated into an IP address. So that makes perfect sense. Um, again, we'll have a local IP address and then a gateway, which means all of the data, we can think about it as if we think about a bunch of cattle uh, or horses in a corral, each horse has a unique name, okay? And they all go through one gate to get out, thus out to the internet. So. What makes it all work is DNS. Internet service providers access a domain name server, which maintains a directory. And the cool thing about this is we then don't have to remember what information or the IP address, for example, for a website. All right, so as we can see now, when I did that original ping, what I'm doing is I'm asking, hey, what IP address is associated with the name www World Wide Web? google.com and you can see that I was given back this address right here okay 67.204.184.209 now that's not the only address that Google has okay but it is one address so how DNS works is if I go out to a browser let me just quickly bring up a browser for us to look at Let me drag that over. All right, um, let's see, that's not gonna work. If I bring over this browser here, and I wanna go to Google, well, through DNS, I would just type www.google.com, and I could get there. Now, what's happening is it's going out to a DNS server and saying what IP address is associated for Google. But watch what happens if I just happen to remember the IP address and I type it into the address bar and hit enter, boom. I'm at Google as well. So, but the thing is we can't remember all these unique IP addresses for all the websites, but we can remember names and that's how DNS works. So let me go in here real quick since my command prompt is working. I'm gonna run a trace route for www. Um, google.com, so we'll stick with Google. And as you can see, it's gonna show me each router that it has to go through to get to Google. And as you can see, Google actually has a presence at Ben Broadband. So it's only having to go to Ben Broadband to get out to Google. Well, let me try to trace route www.microsoft. Dot com, for example. If you notice, it's gonna leave my Turtle Beach router. This is my router. It's gonna go out to a routable IP address at Ben Broadband. It's gonna bounce around some routers at Ben Broadband and then start making its way out to the internet. So it's hitting a router here and here. It's now in Portland on the bar one router, which is a main backbone router and soon, it would get to CenturyLink, out to Seattle, and from Seattle to this uh, akamakitechnologies.com, which is where we would find Microsoft.com. So there is a route, and you can see that it's hopping from router to router to router to make that work. So, so that gives you a great example. Don't think we need to go into the additional video. Here we have a gateway we've talked about. So a gateway connects networks using different communications protocols so that they can pass information. And we saw that in the command prompt, my 10.10.10.1, .10 .10 
was my router's gateway address and then it connected to my ISP to Ben Broad Broadband to then go to Portland to get out to the router. Now how all, all of this works is via packet switching. And packet switching splits data into manageable packets, small pieces, allowing a more efficient flow. Now each piece then, as it's transferred, has information like a packet number so that all the data can be put back together on the other end. I'll give you a, uh, another video showing you kind of how this works, but just know that if we had a Word document and we wanted to transfer it over email, we're gonna break the email and the attachment of the Word document into smaller pieces that can go very quickly over the internet as what's called data packets is listed here. <laughs> so enhanced communications, email, text messaging, social media, other electronic communications certainly have changed the world and how we interact. Um, I'm in a series of cybersecurity classes where I'm actually learning how via the internet of things information about illnesses in Africa are being transferred over text message because they don't have the internet speeds we do, but they're utilizing text messages and small messaging communications mechanisms instead of email like text messaging because they can do that quickly over cellular networks to communicate back and forth with specialists on disease, figure out how to treat, including by the way, doing things like have, giving phones to women that are pregnant so that they can receive text messages reminding them of appointments that they have because they have to travel from you know, village to village to village to finally get to where their appointment is. So we're utilizing that communications technology not only to send a text to our friend or like I send the text to my son that says, SUP, S-U-P, question mark, which means what's up as we know. So huge information sharing now. And as we know, this information sharing is now instant, which means whereas before, say, let's just take a rumor, you know, a high school rumor at school, everybody would have to wait to the next day and we'd have to share it in person. Now that rumor could hit one school, it could hit an entire community, it could hit the world in a matter of minutes. So, and of course this has changed, we'll talk more about this as we go through, but it's changed how we search and research information. People don't go to the library as much, they go online, they go to Wikipedia, they find information that's available over the public internet. Purchase things, well, we're about to come up to the holidays and we all know about purchasing online. You know, it's opened up the world of commerce to us. So no longer are we purchasing from a local store. We could be purchasing from a warehouse sitting in China that sends, you know, the packet packages to us, shipping for free, whatever the case may be. But e-commerce, we'll talk much more about that, has certainly impacted. Online training, well, that's what you're doing right here, right? Instead of having to sit in class because your instructor was ill, you're getting this training online. Where can you consume it? Anywhere. I don't know where you're consuming this. You could be waiting for your kids at, at a game uh, right now. You could be listening to this as you're shopping, or you could be at home in the comfort of your home, connected to the internet, and off you go. <laughs> Folks, telecommunic telecommuting. My neighbor across the street is actually a network engineer for a company that is in Dallas, Texas. So he only goes out there once a month. He works from home and supports a bunch of networks. They're a technology company from here in Bend for a company, like I said, in Texas. So the great thing is we can suddenly get people who are experts to work for our company and live anywhere. I'll tell you how exciting it would be if I could do all of my teaching online like this and then suddenly live in Hawaii. You know, te teach in the evening, have everything up for the next day and surf during the day. Who knows where we go from there? We've seen collaborative environments, you know, things like Google Docs, for example, hardware sharing. So not necessary to purchase a printer or a scanner. We can share that over the over the network. So an example would be in our classroom environments, which all of you have been in, each classroom only has one printer. We don't need to have a printer connected to each and every computer. Think about the expense in your technology fee if we did. But now you can print 
along with anyone else who happens to be in that classroom, or in my case, I can print to a, to a printer halfway across campus. So if I wanna print something out for someone, I can do it. We can share software through servers. So, you know, the idea that we don't need to have software installed on each individual machine, entertainment. I mean, just think about the fact of how Netflix has changed the world of television, how the internet and internet speeds have changed what we're consuming. We're no longer sitting down and watching television. We're sitting down and accessing the internet and being entertained by documentaries that folks are putting on YouTube. Um, even television companies have realized they not only need to offer their content Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, one time, but if you miss that, now you can go onto their website and you can stream that show later on. Privacy, of course, is an issue, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, a lot more about the idea of hackers stealing services, stealing our personal information, how easy it really is. And then, of course, I'm sure all of you have experienced either a virus, malicious code that has taken over your computer. You may even have a virus in your computer right now and not know it. That's very possible, folks. It could be a piece of malicious code that's sitting there waiting to run. We saw that just, just a few weeks ago when a denial of service attack was done on Twitter and Amazon was affected, MSN, huge website presences were affected and the performance of their services were affected by malicious code. And then of course, I'm sure if you haven't already, you've heard me preach about backups and it's because these systems are not foolproof. They have moving parts. We can drop them and we can lose the data that's stored in them. Individual loss of aut autonomy. We will talk more in detail, like I said, about a lot of these topics. Network faults, you know, setup and management costs of these networks, for example. You know, network connection problems are easy to identify. You know, fix the physical connection first. What that means is check if it's plugged in and check if it's turned on before you call technical support. What should you do before you do any technical support? Restart the computer, restart your smartphone. It could just be that a little one and a zero got switched around and locked up the whole system. You know, if you think about it, we've talked about this. Things happen. Be patient. So. If it looks like it's locked up, be patient. You know, recite the Gettysburg Address, for example. I'm just kidding. And wait, and it might come back. It might self-repair itself. And if it doesn't, then we know we can hit the control, the alt, the delete. We can see running tasks. We can fix running tasks. Or we can restart the computer and try it again. If we still have the issue, then we can go out to the web and do some troubleshooting, for example. So we'll talk more about troubleshooting um, and these graphics in class. That's the end of this lecture uh, for networking fundamentals. I hope you all are having a great day. Take care.